In part one, we shot photos and played with ingredients. Now it's on to the main event. Carrie Oliver from Oliver Ranch explains her philosophy of beef. I call this the provenance of beef. Um, it's a series that I take around the country and also offer to people for uh, a home steak tasting. I really want to create a new language for beef. I want to help people move beyond what we currently know and understand um, some really, really interesting things about meat that we haven't been told before and evangelize that. The second is to find and connect people who are interested in, in really great quality meat, um, which what I would say is genuinely, naturally, organically raised and artisan quality, connect you to the, the people who actually make the beef. So reduce the number of steps between farm and fork uh, in an effort to support best practices. This little light bulb went off. I said, could beef and other meats, could they be more like wine? Are we missing something? Have we oversimplified what constitutes taste, quality, and, uh, and, and texture? So I'll go one round with the steaks alone. We'll use a tasting guide, and we can discuss that. And then I typically go back and say, now try it as you would with food or with wine, and see if the, mm -hmm. the, the textures and the things that they appeal to you in a different way than they did before. So I think that sounds good. We have, and we have all our side dishes, and we yep. have all our accompaniments that we can sample after we've tasted the steaks themselves. That's all right. Yep. Cool. So we're going to start uh, prepping all of this because as you can see, we got a lot of work ahead of us. <laughs> I made up an easy compound butter with chopped sage that would accompany the dishes after the tasting. I then prepped a red and white salad with pecans and a port wine reduction, while Anu Karwa explained the wine she chose for the evening. All right, so we've got a couple selections here today to pair with all of our different steaks from Terrazas, Reserve Malbec from Mendoza, you know, the heartland of Argentina's wine country. The next selection, a little bit different. So this is 100% Petit Verdot um, from Marques de Grillon, and um, it's going to be really robust. You're going to need something chewy to go along with it because it's got a lot of grip on the tannins. This is going to be perfect for your steaks. Actually, all three of these will just kind of add something a little bit different to the different kinds of steaks and the sauces that we're going to be using. This one is a Cabernet Sauvignon from um, Casa La Postal. It's named Winery of the Year from Wine Enthusiast. Um, and they're really great vineyard, all handcrafted, hand harvested stuff. Um, big, robust, but I love where also. I know, yeah. we're decanting in a vase. We have a lot of water. Yeah, water night, pitcher. And last night. Anything you can. I, so the process of uh, preparing for a, an artisan steak tasting is a little bit complicated because we got to keep them all separate. So these two are of one particular variety. Now what kind of steaks are these? Uh, well, Carrie's going to tell us all about them, but the whole secret here is that we can't say what they are because okay, we're going to okay, taste them okay. and decide which one is best, and then she's going to tell us what they are. There's a little bit of a different color that's, that you can see between the steaks, but most importantly, look at the relative size. And this breed, no surprise perhaps, is a lot bigger than this one. So look so at this one. This one's got a nice complement of fat on the outside, which when you're broiling that, you want to leave that on. Leave it whole like this. A lot of people say, oh, there's too much fat. Cut it off. Oh, no. Leave it on there. Broil it. Let the fat get it, you know, render itself out, put it into the steak. And then maybe you won't eat the whole bit of the fat, but leave it on there for the cooking. Mm. If you do a blind taste test and you don't know what the beef is in advance, you're kind of just exploring it from a palate perspective. So let's just go into that because I, I can see that some of the steaks are just resting. <laughs> It was time to taste, and we couldn't resist digging in. Overall, did people notice the differences? Yes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I'm sure every palate is different, and every person has a preference. I know Grace and I were over here, we tasted number one, and we just went, <clears throat> beef. Number it was yeah. just beef and, yeah. and nothing else. I like a buttery, you know, melt in your mouth type of steak. Mm. I don't like it really chewy, mm. and I thought, Flavors were so good because it was just kind of just dissolved in your mouth, as opposed to chewing it and breaking it down to get the taste. So I really like this one. And who enjoyed number three the best? Me, I did. Yeah. <laughs> number three, I love the flavor. Number three. Butter. Yeah. Butter. Butter. I, I went back three. to three. <laughs> I thought it was kind of more toward the mushy end, and I wrote boring. You and thought no, the I texture was it. mushy? Yeah. <laughs> Are you going to argue with me? Yes, I will. You're wrong. You're right. wrong. What makes Kobe, Kobe beef so special? 
It, Kobe is actually a, a breed, and in order to f call it Kobe, you, it has to be in Japan, and it's a special breed, and raised in Japan, and processed. Uh, what's here, actually the breed is called Wagyu, and what's here, that you find here, and they call it Kobe, might not be Kobe, it might just be Wagyu, the breed, and it raised in America, which is crossbred with possibly Angus, and they serve it to you and they call it Kobe, but really, it really shouldn't be called Kobe. Right, and the reason it's kind of special is it has to do with the ecology and the culture of Japan because beef was so valuable and no beef was eaten until the 18th century. And once they got the cow, they don't have any land in mm -hmm. Japan, so each cow is specially cared for. Yeah. Therefore, the myths, I mean, yeah. all the Well, they get the massaged and everything. Well, yeah, because yeah. the flesh is massaged. Those animals, they're talking about cages. I want to be that They cow. are, you know, tethered in, the, in their little cage. They right. never move. But the main thing is, A, the breed is developed so that it will marble ten times as much as our prime, essential. So it's mm -hmm. really white beef. And... It is uh, taken care of from the skin out, from, it's taken total care of, and it's mm -hmm. aged at least sort of two to three years in order to put on that weight. So mm -hmm. it puts on weight slowly as opposed to an Angus, which may have put it on in, in okay. half, um, 50 months. Would you still say that it has incredible flavor because it's just I, stay still? And, I don't even I think, think of it so. as beef. I think of it as beef butter. Yeah. 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 The yeah. flavor exactly. is, and if you love the texture of foie gras, as I do, yeah. is closest yeah. to foie gras. Exactly. Yeah. It's not at all like what we've just been eating. Yeah. Carrie, thank you so much for this enlightening tasting tonight. I mean, we got to see flavor profiles and where beef comes from and, and why we should like the really good stuff. So thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. 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 Cheers.